today about the result of spiritual maturity. And um, as, I, as I think about that, um, uh, I, I, I have an image uh, that I'm going to present in just a minute, but I love this passage of scripture that Paul presents for us right here. And uh, it starts in verse 6, where it says in Colossians chapter 2, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised you from the dead. And so I just, I love this passage of scripture. And if you remember, last week we talked about how, um, like the course of spiritual growth uh, happens in we kind of outlined from the text of uh, verses one through five at the start of the chapter, like four different ways. And I'll, I'll get to recap that in a moment. But today, again, we're talking about maturity. And as I think about like things that are mature, things that are, that are bigger or that people who exhibit maturity, one of the images that just really stood out to me was uh, one of, of redwood trees, right? So I don't uh, love everything about California. I'm sure you don't either. But one of the great things is that there are so many beautiful and unique features about California, right? And um, I don't know if you know this, but there's actually a redwood grove in uh, like Brea. Um, now they're much smaller. Uh, and since they're not coastal, um, they're, they're almost like dwarfs. And, and uh, it's kind of interesting. You can, you can go see them uh, in like a half an hour. But if you go up north, you'll see some of these towering just sentinel-like trees. It's just so beautiful. And you kind of look at them and you wonder how in the world did they get so big and so mature? Well, there's a number of things that contribute to that growth, right? So they have um, this uh, special kind of resin that they produce that makes the, uh, that is almost like a natural fire retardant. So that's really cool. Um, and of course, there's, they're, they're just massive, right? And so that's really great too. But what really sticks out to me is that they have this root system. And this root system is kind of interesting because for as big as the tree is, the roots really don't go down that deep, right? So whereas most roots for other trees go down pretty deep, what redwood trees do and the way that God made them is that they go down, you know, about maybe 12 feet, but their roots can spread out like 20, 30 feet around them. And they gain strength from the other trees that are nearby them. And I just think that's the coolest thing in the world. It's a system. It's, it's something that like the, the more trees that they're around, the stronger the individual tree is, right? And, and I, I, there, I mean, there's so many metaphors and there's so many ways that we can relate this to Christianity. But I, I just, I, one of my favorite things to do is in Redwood, um, in Redwood State Park or in you know, some of these other places where you can see the redwoods is just to lay down and kind of look up at them. Or Sarah and I have an opportunity sometimes to go up to Mount Hermon Christian Camp. It's outside of Santa Cruz in a town called Felton. And there's uh, massive redwoods nearby. And it's so cool to just kind of lay down and look at them and kind of lose yourself as, you know, I, I like to think of myself and my problems as really big when, in fact, they're so small in comparison to these giant, amazing, beautiful trees uh, that are, are towering in front of me. And I think about that in terms of, uh, of how uh, the trajectory of growth that God wants us to be on, how that relates to us, right? And if you remember last week, this is, this is kind of uh, just a recall from, from this last week. Um, growth really comes from understanding Christ's love, understanding that he loves and, and because he first loved us, now we love. And I made the point last week about how um, we should understand the love that the church has for one another. Again, that it's like this root system. The stronger that the root system is, the stronger that the grove is, the stronger that the individual trees are because of the community around them. But we also talked about uh, growth coming from a thorough understanding of Christ, right? Now, again, not that 
the, um, the extent of our faith is cognitive only or like in our minds only, but it starts there. And an understanding of that is imperative. And then it goes not so much from the heart, right? Into, uh, sorry, not so much just in the, in the head, but also to the heart where there's a deep fellowship with Christ. And then I made the point at the end of the chapter that staying the course with Christ is really what contributes to growth. But today we're going to talk about what maturity looks like. And I, I, I'd like if, if you would, just to take a moment, you don't have to close your eyes, but just kind of in your mind's eye, I want you to imagine someone who's very spiritually mature. And I want you to imagine what characteristics they might have, <clears throat> some of the things that they might exhibit, or some of the traits that they might possess. And I wonder if maybe you have some of those, like if you would, wouldn't mind sharing them with the congregation. Because I have someone in my head that I'm like, wow, I would really love to be like that. And I think what Paul does in this passage is he eloquently and beautifully outlines many things, but one of the things he outlines is what it looks like, not just to grow in Christ, but to achieve maturity. And of course, we'll always be, achieve, we'll always be growing, but to achieve a state of maturity where people go, you know what, I'd really like to end up like that. And so does anyone have anything where you're like, hey, I've been around this person, and who knows, maybe they're, you know, this big ministry leader, probably not though. Does anyone have any characteristics of spiritual growth that you're like, yeah, I'd like to emulate that? Go ahead, Joe. Uh, there's some characters on TV, yeah. but they don't get mad when something bad happens. Yeah. And they're very bad. I can't. Yeah. Right. Right. They just are calm the whole time. Yeah, they're almost unfazed by some of those things. Great, great. Yeah. Anyone else? Go ahead, Don. The people who show great compassion and mercy yeah. towards others. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. They're not always showy in their uh, demonstration of generosity or mercy, as, uh, as Dave helped us kind of distinguish between the grace and the mercy today. But, but as you get to see them, that shines through. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Go ahead, Dwayne. When I grow up, I want to be like you. Well, I mean, obviously. <laughs> but no, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. No, but did, were you going to, because I was, I, was, I was expecting a dad joke, but that was a mic joke. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, any, anyone else in all seriousness? Yes, sir. Brian. They've gone through major trials. Yeah. And came out stronger. Right. Yeah. Well, said. Yeah. 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 For me, it's, it's um, a, a characteristic of consistency, and, and we're going we're gonna to talk about that. And a lot of, a lot of you kind of hit on that already, but to be consistent, to, you know, again and again, over and over again, wake up, do something, and be consistent is, is one of those marks of maturity that I think um, that we, we, we often underestimate. It's not always about the gifts of the Spirit, because someone can be gifted and flawed. It's about the fruit of the Spirit, Right? Because someone doesn't have to be spectacularly gifted, but boy, when you're around them, goodness and mercy followed them, like Psalm 23 says. So let's talk now about the results of spiritual maturity, and thank you all for your contribution to that. It's occasionally fun to hear what you guys are thinking about that. So the result of spiritual maturity is this. Spiritually mature people are rooted and steadfast. And again, I love this because Colossians 6 through, uh, verse 6 through 7 in chapter 2 outline this, right? Now, I, I want to call attention to a little bit of the grammatical features of this text and of this pack, uh, passage, right? Therefore, right, whenever there's a therefore, whenever, you know, you see that your, your mind should start be thinking, of, uh, start to think about like, okay, what's, what's going on? What is it there for? Why is it, you know, doing this or that? So the word therefore is an important grammatical word. It sets off and it shows uh, that basically everything that came before, Paul is now making a point or an application of it. And he says, as you've received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him, right? And that, and that word walk, it is um, the dominant verb through it. Now, I know that it's early and you don't want a grammatical lesson, but Verbs drive sentences. Verbs drive meaning, right? So you can't really make a sentence with just nouns or just adjectives or even just adverbs, right? Like, it would make no sense if I was like, chair, plane, church, 
right? Like, I mean, it could be like a maybe clever poem, but like it's, it's not really like all that special. But if I were to say, go, disciple, baptize, like you, you'd be like, oh, he's talking about the Great Commission. You know, like, like you can derive meaning from that. Now, the reason why I say that is the, um, the, the dominant verb in this, uh, in this passage is to walk with him, right? To, to, uh, and the Greek word for that is peripateo. That is like where we get the English word peripatetic, someone who's going along. So walk in him, right? But then it, as, as helping verbs, uh, these, are, these are called participles. It talks about being rooted and being built up and being established and, and then abounding in thanksgiving. In other words, like this is what the result of walking with Christ looks like, that you'll be rooted, that you'll be uh, brought, built up rather, that you'll be established and that you will be abounding in thanksgiving. So think back, if you will, to the, uh, the redwood trees, right? That their, their root system is so special and so different than most other trees because it spreads out. It just doesn't go deep, even though it does that, but it's primarily deriving benefit and stability from the people or from the trees around it. And so, too, we uh, derive that stability and that rootedness or that steadfastness. If I could speak English this morning, that would be helpful. Um, and we would derive that from, from being rooted and being grounded in the people around us. Now, this can look like a, a number of different ways, right? So, so the older I get, the, the more I realize uh, the idols of my heart, right? And when I talk about the idols of my heart, like, don't worry, I am not tempted to worship Moloch or Baal or like, you know, like I, I have no, like I don't have totem poles in my garage, but I do have certain ways that my heart is inclined that are not altogether from God. And I have a sneaking suspicion that I'm not alone, right? So one of the idols of my heart is I long for and I desire safety and security above all other things. So that has manifested itself in a number of ways in my life. Um, and one of them is that I'm incredibly risk averse, right? So like I have, I'm, I'm, I'm a nerd. I, I, I like insurance. Isn't that weird? Right? Like, like I have insurance for my insurance, like an umbrella policy, right? Like I want to make sure that I'm covered. I want to make sure that that rainy day, if it does come, that I'll be covered. And, I, you know, there's nothing wrong with being careful, but there is something wrong when God tells you to step out in faith and you don't want to do it because you're too scared. And that has manifested itself a number of times in my life. But thankfully, um, I, I, maybe just because of the way that, that, that he's wired me, right? So I stepped away from a, a church that I was in all my life. And I had had relationships there that were uh, longstanding and meaningful. Um, it was, a, it was a, a place that I was discipled in. And I walked away to go to a different church. Um, and uh, and God, God was in that. But at this different church, I have never been so stressed. I have never been so anxious. I have never, it, was, it was like walking into like a Fortune 500 type uh, environment. Like it was like walking into a startup. And I realize some of you are not familiar with that because you've gone to small churches all your whole life. But like if you go to a mega church, you got to understand that they almost approach it as a business. Good, bad, and different. And there's a reason why I'm not in a mega church now. Some of them can do really good. I'm not saying that, but it's like, you know, when I went to this church, it was like everything was like a business decision. And I was, it was a huge culture shock. And I was just out of my element. And I was suffering really debilitating anxiety and really debilitating depression. It was really strange. I'm not talking about clinical and I'm not talking about you know anything like that, but I realized that I suffered so much in part because I was not rooted and grounded in Christ. Because I, I, I sort of had these other ancillary things that I was more concerned about, like my safety and my security and my well-being. And it was so difficult for me because I felt like I do not understand why God is, is, is uh, allowing these things to happen. You know, like I, why uh, these people around me are, are, are being let go and why, you know, th there's so many dishonest and awful decisions. I mean, you just, mega churches are tough because, you know, like the rate at which people are, I mean, just doing really immoral things is just, it's, it's hard. Not all mega churches are like that. But I was, I was sitting there and I was just, I, I realized that 
part of what was contributing to my anxiety and to my depression was the fact that I was not spiritually mature because my well-being was not rooted in Christ. It was rooted in me and what I could do to ensure that I had a safe time. And when the time came that God released me from that assignment, and I was incredibly grateful, there were so many churches that I was considering going to, not based on God's calling in my life, but based on what would be easiest, right? And what would be like most convenient. And then God was like, all right, so you're, you're insecure and you uh, long for safety. I got a perfect place for you. How about a church restart up, right? How about a church that at this time was hemorrhaging money and members and, you know, basically needed a whole reboot, which I, I don't know, like, if you know this, but there's a whole world of people who are church planters and they're entrepreneurs, they're go-getters, they're amazing. And I have none of those gifts, none of them, right? I'm a nerd. I like Greek and Hebrew. Like, I, I like to, you know, cloister myself off in my office and then I get so, like, like um, uh, pent up, and I'm like, I need to be relational, you know, but like these people are like canvassing neighborhoods, pounding the pavement, letting people know, and God places me in this position, I think in part to say, hey, are you going to trust me? And then, if that's not enough, because God is not primarily concerned about my well-being or my having fun or my enjoying this, you know, my best life now or whatever, God says, I want you to join the army. There is no more, like, crazy, insecure environment than that, right? Like, it is, it is nuts, like, any, at any time, you know? Like, you could be deployed across the world. Like, it, it is nuts. But through this time, through this stretching, I have learned that I can look to people who are farther along on the road than me, and I can say they're mature because they're rooted and they're steadfast, even in the midst of difficulty, and that's what I want to be like. And that's what I'm hoping to grow like, right? Because their root system is deeper and wider than mine is. It's not just all about me. It's not just all about, like, my, um, my safety, my security, you know, my well-being. It's about what does God want to do with, with me? And, and, and a larger kingdom priority of what does God want to do with his kingdom? And I'm just a player in that, right? Like, like a small, small, small player. And that is in a way, so refreshing. Because when we have a really radically individualistic idea about what God might want to do, it actually contributes to our anxiety, not takes it away. Like, it doesn't decrease it. And so my encouragement to all of us today is like, you know, realize that God's MO for us right now is not that we have a good time or that we have an easy life. In fact, he might be calling us to an increasingly difficult life. His MO is for us to grow into Christ. Like, that's the priority of Scripture. And when we think about it like that, then it doesn't make suffering easier, but it makes it purposeful. Does that make sense? That was so unconvincing. That's all right. But suffering's never going to be easy. Like, like, for instance, like I used to love to run, and, and I, would, I would run... Um, like half marathons is not incredibly impressive at all, uh, spectacularly mediocre, you know, claw my way up to the middle kind of thing. But every time I would embark on that half, it didn't matter how much I trained, it didn't matter how well I did on my nutrition and my sleep and I hacked all these things. Every time, right on the starting line, I would go, you're an idiot. Why are you subjecting yourself to this pain? And then I was dumb enough to do a full marathon. You're an idiot. Why did you subject yourself to this pain? Mile six, mile you know, 20, mile 22, it's like, what were you thinking? So trials will never, ever be easy, but they might be purposeful. Because each time that I finished one of those runs, I learned something about myself. Each time that I learned, each time that I, uh, that I did something difficult, it's like, you know, now I'm, I'm, I'm doing some weightlifting stuff. And each time I'm under the bar, it stinks. It's not fun, but it's meaningful because it's producing something. And that's what trials do. So that's why we need wisdom. And the wisdom is to realize that God's not doing this to punish us. God's doing this to create within us and cultivate within us growth so that we become like Christ. So spiritually mature people are rooted and steadfast. But let's move on because they also have different marks. And we see this in verse 8. Spiritually mature people are also discerning. And what do I mean by discerning? 
Well, it means that these are people who can sniff out certain things. Again, I, I've used this example before, but you know, the, when when uh, someone that I knew used to who used to deposit like a lot of cash. So this is before credit cards became ubiquitous, and there was no PayPal, and there was no kind of online vending. This was in the early 90s. This person used to deposit a lot of cash, and you know, the teller. I, I used this example before, but the teller would be counting and you know counting, and then kind of separate one bill, and then counting and counting, and then separate another bill, and the person. Depositing it was like, what, what, what is that? What, why are you separating them? Because they're counterfeit, because they're not real. And he said, well, how can you tell that they're not real? And the funny thing is she didn't say, well, by studying the counterfeits. I mean, that might be a worthwhile venture, but she said instead, the way that she could tell the counterfeits is that she had spent so much time with the real thing. Does that make sense? So like, when we spend time with Christ, we can actually see what's real, and then we can uh, filter the grid of life through that. And I got to tell you, there are so many of us, me included, who, who, who harbor thoughts and ways of thinking, cognitions you might call them, that are completely distorted and are completely wrong. And they're contributing to our anxiety or they're contributing to our feelings of depression. They're contributing to the fact that we are... Um, uh, sad or, or, or angry all the time. And Christianity is not just about fixing your thinking process, but that's a start, right? Because like, what happens if you have wrong theology? I don't think that having wrong theology is going to you know, like send you to hell, right? But I do think that having right theology can definitely alleviate a lot of the problems that we have and suffer now. And I think the biggest one is that suffering is, it has got to be from the enemy, right? Sometimes suffering can be used for good. Sometimes suffering can be redemptive. But I think a, a, another part of this is that, like, when we're discerning, we can appreciate good theology. So I realize that, you know, there are so many uh, better, more polished speakers out there who um, uh, speak to millions of people, right? Like, not just in their service, where they can pack out, like, um, like the Astrodome, right? Like, the, the, these people are really polished and incredibly good speakers, but their content is completely vapid. Like, there's nothing there, right? And part of the reason why I uh, am totally content with being like, hey, that was like, that was heavy. It wasn't like the most exciting thing, but like there were some good things, you know, in there, like as far as theology is concerned. Part of the reason why I'm content to do that is because it's really important for us to know theology. It's really important for us to know who Christ is and who God is in Christ and to grasp that like we serve a good God and a God who's gracious. And so spiritually mature people are discerning because if they understand, they might not be like, theologians like R.C. Sproul or something, but if they understand theology, then they can discern between what's real and what's not, what corresponds with reality and what doesn't. And this is where Paul says in Colossians 2.8, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Now, if you'll recall, Several uh, weeks ago, at the start of our study through the book of Colossians, I mentioned that a number of commentators say that Paul was combating a belief system called Gnosticism. I do not subscribe to that view. And that's okay. There's a lot of commentators who are far smarter and more gifted that do. But I think that, um, and I don't want to give my attention to, like, why I believe this. I'm totally open to a dialogue about it. But, like, I read a really good article when I was in seminary called Why the Study of Gnosticism is Irrelevant to the Writing of the New Testament. It really was important in the early centuries of the church. But it didn't necessarily have bearing on the um, people at Colossae at the time uh, at which Paul was writing it. But here's what the struggle was. These people believed in magic, and they believed in um, certain uh, practices that would set you up for success. And they were very shaped, not just by 
uh, Gre uh, Greco-Roman thought, but they were also shaped by Persian thought. And they had this eclectic kind of syncretistic, and I know those are <laughs> big words, but they had this idea of things that like, hey, there's a God everywhere. There's a God of you know the, the, the sky. There's a God of the, the land. There's a God of the rain. There's a God of you know, drought. Or, you know, but there's also individual mini-gods. There was a God of the hearth. There was a god, a goddess of you know this and that, and if you could do the right practices, then you could manipulate the deities so that you can have an easier life. Does that make sense? So this was like a big thing for a lot of the early church, and the point that I want to make with what Paul is combating is this: for us to say that Paul was was fighting big G Gnosticism, because it actually starts with a G, but to say that he was fighting with big G Gnosticism is to kind of assume that within paganism there's orthodoxy, and that's ludicrous, because inherent within paganism is paganism, and a number of different beliefs that don't make sense and don't like go together, and that are conflicting. Orthodoxy is unique to religions of the book, whether they're Islam or uh, Christianity or uh, Judaism. Now, I happen to think that only this is orthodox. However, that being said, here's the point that I want to make. The hollow philosophies, right? The, 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 the empty deceit, the human tradition and the elemental spirits of the world that Paul was combating in this passage, that he was saying uh, in this passage was this, right? That God, uh, God wants us to be so filled with the real thing that when we sniff out a counter, or that when we see a counterfeit, we can sniff it out. That's the overarching point. Regardless of what they might believe in in Colossae, the the the, um, the point still is the same for us today. Okay, so and it, I'm not even talking about like little things like oh I have a lucky rabbit's foot like that's dumb but you know whatever like I don't think I, again I don't think you should but it's like it's 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 not it's it's not like driving your life but I know that there are some people who are uh, really suffering under the burden that you know God is mad at them if they do don't do their devotions and the reason why they're suffering is because they haven't done what God has told them to do in a sense hear me out. In a sense, that discipline can be turned into magic, which then can be used to manipulate God. Because the line of thinking, follow me here, right? right? The line of thinking is, if he's mad at me, I didn't do my devotions, that's why I'm being punished. Then the converse might be true. He'll be happy at me if I do my devotions, and I won't get punished. So it's a way to manipulate God. That's nothing more than what the Colossian, Colossian believers were struggling with. They wanted, at the end of the day, to have an easier life. And that's kind of the way that we can be tempted to treat God, and that is not the way that he wants to be treated. The book of Job makes that incredibly clear. More on that later. I'm excited to talk about the book of Job. But I hope that you guys understand that and can appreciate that. Let's move on. Spiritually mature people are also filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, again, this is another one that can trip people up. Let's read verses 9 through 11. It's here on the screen. It says, For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of flesh, by the circumcision of Christ. Now, what in the world does that mean? Huh? Like, Paul, I, I'm, I'm a bit confused. Well, let's, let's tackle the first, the first part first, right? So the um, Christ, like wh whatever, so we call this, it's a Latin term, but like quiddity. Say quiddity. It's just so much fun to say. Quiddity. Okay, thank you for the two of you that said it. Um, so quiddity is the essence of something. So what makes me human, you share. That's quiddity. So what makes God, God, Jesus shares. Now, let me just make this, uh, again, I incorporate theology, and some of you, like, this is like a perfect time to snooze. <laughs> Phil's not here, so I can't pick on him. So I'm looking at you, Julia. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Love you. Um, so here's the deal. Remember, there's attributes of God that are communicable and incommunicable. 
right? So like that, that, that he gives and that he doesn't give, right? So an attribute of God that he gave to us is creativity, right? That's what he gave in the garden. He says, hey, here's this, here's this garden teeming with potential. Go and do something with it. Like, like make something out of it, right? So that's a communicable attribute. But there are some things that are uncommunicable. Like I can't like walk through doors. Can, can you? Right? Like, like, but Jesus could in his resurrected body. So there are certain attributes of God that he's given to us and others that he hasn't. So whatever, the, in, the, in this first clause here, for in him the whole fullness of the deity dwells bodily, whatever God has, Jesus has. That's why the doctrine of the Trinity is very important. Does that make sense? I hope you guys understand the doctrine of the Trinity. If you've been in church, you've heard it a million times. But if you're newer to church, it's a little bit confusing. So does that mean we believe in three gods? No, right? Does that, believe, does that mean that God is just like an egg? Like, one, in one instance, he's God, and then in one instance, he's Jesus, and then in one instance, he's the Holy Spirit. No, right? We believe that God is one. We're monotheists, but we believe that uh, within the, the, the Trinity, we can distinguish between essence and person. So, so the essence or the quiddity of, of God, Jesus shares and the Holy Spirit shares, but there are different persons within the Trinity. So hopefully that's a helpful distinction. Now, that's what Paul's trying to say, but then he gets even like into a cooler argument. So stay with me just for a second. I, I wish I could say this like my teacher did. Buckle your seatbelts because it's exciting, right? But you guys are like, whatever. I'm not buckling my seatbelt. For in him the whole fullness of the deity dwells bodily, but you have been filled in him. Now again, remember, remember God's presence in the Old Testament, was it kind of like warm and fuzzy? In the Old Testament, I'm talking about. Like in the temple, was he just like, yeah, come on, God, I want to cuddle up next to you. Jesus is my homeboy. Like, did, did it feel like that or was it terrifying? Terrifying and deadly. Holiness was not something that you generally wanted to be around. It was something that probably resulted in the death of something. That's why holiness is often associated with blood, and blood usually comes from either sacrifice things, like you cut yourself, or dead things. So, now, to think about this now, that Jesus, once he comes on the scene of human history, he is God walking among us, and God's presence progressively gets closer, and then, after Jesus leaves the scene of human history, he says, hey, I'm going to give you another helper, and you're going to do greater things. In other words, like, you're going to do greater things because the Holy Spirit dwells within you. So the Holy Spirit is the, the most amazing manifestation of God's presence within our lives. Because as a result of that, now we have Christ's Spirit, the same Spirit that indwells Christ, in us. Right? That's what Romans 8 says. This is absolutely incredible. Because he's the head of all rule and authority. And then he gets into circumcision. Right? Now, I can tell, Chuck, you're blushing, but we got to talk about circumcision this morning, right? And, and the whole point of this, that was a joke, I'm sorry. In the second service, I will not bring up that joke. But the, the whole point of this, right, is that people believed that by virtue of their circumcision that they were in the covenant. But what Paul and then before him, Jesus did, is make sure that they knew that simply by virtue of the practices that they practiced, they were not in the kingdom. Because there were some whose heart were, hearts were hard toward God, and they were outside of, the, of the, the, the covenant in that sense. So the circumcision, or the removing of flesh, which circumcision uh, rep- represents, that um, there's, a, there's like almost a higher sense of what God can do through Jesus in removing the, the flesh that um, uh, surrounds us and, indwell, and, and then the spirit that indwells us. So I hope that makes sense. But we'll, we'll move on here. And this is, this is uh, such a cool verse, right? 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. So... To be in Christ is, is a really interesting thought. Like, you, you live in him because he lives in you. And I realize, like, to us, we're like, yeah, well, I mean, I've heard that. But, like, this should be really shocking to us. Because, to go back to my point, spiritually mature people are filled with the Holy Spirit. And you can tell 
that they're filled with the Holy Spirit. And I'll be the first to admit that a lot of times the way that I operate is not by being filled with the Holy Spirit. So some people say this, well, does that mean that you need to get baptized with the Holy Spirit again? And again, this is where I, I want to make the argument, and this could be a whole thing in itself. I believe that baptiz the baptism of the Holy Spirit happens at salvation. But, so it's a one-time event, right? But what happens again and again and again is the filling of the Holy Spirit, right? So Paul says, be y'all filled with the Holy Spirit. He uses a second person plural, okay? He says, you all be filled with the Holy Spirit, and he contrasts that with not being drunk with wine, which you can do again and again, right? But like the other, uh, the other part of that grammatically is that the construction of the verb indicates that it should be continual, that it should be one thing, like one thing after another, like you should be filled continually with the Holy Spirit. And so there are times that a Christian can experience um, uh, th that they can practice, rather, practice things that are incompatible with the, the Holy Spirit. And the, and the scripture demonstrates this in a really, or it communicates this in a, in a really interesting way. It says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Have you ever really thought about that? Like, to grieve the Holy Spirit? What an interesting way to put it. Because I'm always afraid that I'm going to make God angry. Like, am I alone? Right? But, like, the way that it says that when you operate apart from the Holy Spirit, you can grieve him. Well, if that's true, then the opposite is to be filled with the Holy Spirit so that when you live and like operate and walk, then a lot of times your actions are characterized by the Holy Spirit. And so that's why to be filled with the Holy Spirit is a continual thing. And this is something that we should be praying for. Right now, now, again, it's not some kind of like, I, I'm not saying that, that it's going to be some kind of showy, some kind of like emphasis on the sign gifts. That's a whole other discussion. And, and we can have that. And I would be really excited to talk about that. But to be filled with the Holy Spirit means that you are exhibiting a lot of times the fruits of the Spirit. So it's not necessarily that you are like the number one preacher when you ask or that you're going to get that yacht that you've always wanted, or that, you know, the Maserati is going to be changed for the Mazda. You know, it's not that. It's instead that you're exhibiting, you know, grace and peace, right? That you're exhibiting love and, and, and long-suffering, that all of these things are true. And so, finally, spiritually mature people have the joy of final victory. What do I mean by this? Well, let's read verse 12, and then I'll explain it further. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. <clears throat> so I think what Paul is trying to say here is this. In baptism, which is an incredibly important institution, right? If you have not been baptized, like, you need to be baptized. It's not, it's, it's, it's not uh, crucial for your salvation, but it is an absolutely crucial expression of your uh, oneness with, with Christ, Spiritually mature people have the, final, uh, the joy of final victory because just as Christ was baptized and then he was raised, so too we will experience one day death. We will experience, that, that the, in, in a sense, the bitterness of that, but the sting of it is gone. And that's where Paul says, right, O oh death, where is your victory? You know, O oh death, where is your sting? In, in other words, like, we know that, when, we're, um, when, when we die, which can be defined as the uh, separation of the, of the soul from the body, when we die, it's difficult. We grieve, right? We grieve our loved ones. We, 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 sorry, the, the, our loved ones who die. And we grieve uh, that, that we're um, apart from them. But those who have trusted in Christ, we, we know that that's not the last time we'll see them. And so there's, there's a, a wonderful hopefulness in our grieving. As Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4, don't, uh, we, we grieve, but not as those who have no hope. And so we have the final victory because we know that just as, just as Christ was baptized and, 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 and he died, right? Like, it, sorry, it, he died. We are also baptized, symbolizing death, but we're raised in him just as he was resurrected. And so the take-home truth, brothers and sisters, is this. What if the point of life is not to maximize our happiness, right? Our pleasure or our fun, as I talked about in the beginning. 
What if instead the point was to grow in Christ? Because if we actually framed things like this, think about what would change. Like, it's interesting that anxiety is fear about the future, and depression is also, a lot of times, like fear or foreboding about the past. But like, both of those prevent us from living in the present, and it's in the present that God says, I really want to do something in your life. I want you to grow, I want you to change, I want you to be molded. And see, if we could grasp the right theology that God's primarily in the program of growing us up, then maybe our suffering would have purpose. It wouldn't be easier, just like I'm always kicking myself, why did I do this race again? But it will be meaningful. And so my encouragement to all of you, because, you know, I love Nathaniel's song, and he, he's right, we've all experienced such difficulty in this room, and we're experiencing brokenness, and we're seeing other people experience brokenness. And the response to that isn't like, hey, don't worry, God's growing you, right? Like, that's a little insensitive. But to sit with them and to acknowledge that it hurts, but God could be doing something through this. And God is doing something through this. We pray for us. So, Father God, thank you for this day and for this time that we can um, reflect on um, what it means to be mature in Christ, what it means to, um, to grow and to develop along on the way with you, Lord. Would you help us to be spiritually mature? Um, and in order to do that, would you help us to realize um, the, 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 the trajectory of, of growth and that it oftentimes involves suffering and involves trials and tribulations, but to be a good cheer because you've overcome the world. So right now, Lord, would you uh, remind us of your overcoming the world um, through communion? And would you remind us of the final victory that we have in Christ? Not by virtue of what we've done, but by virtue of what you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, today's benediction uh, comes from the book of uh, Romans in uh, chapter 8, verse 23. And here, just to set it up very quickly, um, Paul is trying to make the point that um, just as we have uh, seen futility, we'll see redemption. And so he says here, And not only creations, but we ourselves who are the first fruit of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we eagerly wait for adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope is seen is not hope, but for, uh, for who hopes in what he sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it in patience. And so go uh, in grace and peace. God bless you, brothers and sisters, and let's go with that hope. God bless you.